Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Masi, um, the SRH coordinator. I've been coordinating all these BHMC trainings. Uh, thank you for joining today's session. Uh, we are going to have our speaker. He was the one that also taught us on that first. He's also going to take us through today's session. Uh, minute a minute. Okay. Kasim is going to take us on today's session, and if if by chance you have last week's any 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 question from the previous lesson on breastfeeding and cup feeding, we can also ask today through the chat box, or you, you raise your hand, and then I will uh, you'll be admitted, and then you ask the question. Uh, welcome, Capsin. We are going to do today nutrition during lactation. Okay, the course speaker who, who was not able to be around, she's also having another training. She was called Christine, but if you, in the next, I probably on sixth, we'll have her and do, okay, do talk to us about, about nutrition also during lactation. Thank you so much. Welcome, Capsin. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you are breaking a bit. Uh, I want to hope that it's not my network. <laughs> I hope I'm clear. Yes, you're clear. Okay, thank you so much. So just a minute um, so that I share my presentation before we begin. Uh, please confirm you can see the screen. Yes, it's clear. Yes. Okay, so thank you so much. As uh, I've been introduced, my name is Kasim Lupau. I'm a public health nutritionist by profession. 
And I work for. Okay, you can unmute yourself. Sorry, sorry. Um, now, this is the outline of our presentation today. So I'm going to give a bit of a background on uh, nutrition for women who are breastfeeding or generally maternal nutrition. And then uh, I'll talk about the food groups for maternal nutrition and then finally narrow now on how we are supposed to feed or how breastfeeding mothers are supposed to, to be fed. Okay. Um, okay. Sawa, sawa, thank you. So, now let's begin. Okay, so more often than not, um, women in most cases are faced with the challenges of micronutrient deficiency. And uh, when we say micronutrient deficiency, um, here we refer to nutrients that our body require in a very small amounts. I know we are used to macronutrients, uh, things like uh, carbohydrates, uh, proteins, uh, which are required in uh, large amounts. But uh, now we have other nutrients that our bodies require in small amounts. And uh, in most cases, um, because of uh, how our women eat, uh, they are likely to have um, uh, that problem of micronutrient deficiency. Now, I'm going to talk about food groups later. And uh, what you need to know that um, now, the more food groups women eat, then the more li they are likely to meet the micronutrient adequacy. And then um, there is an organization called the uh, FAO, which is uh, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization, together with other stakeholders, in the, uh, in the food security sector have recommended that women are supposed to eat at least five food groups out of the 10 uh, food groups per day. So we are going to look at the food groups for maternal nutrition. And uh, ideally we have 10 food groups. So out of the 10 food groups, um, a mother, is supposed to eat, especially a pregnant and lactating. So he's supposed to eat food from at least five food groups out of these 10. And we are going to see later on how uh, that can be achieved. Uh, for adequate uh, dietary diversity, uh, several foods are grouped together. So you need to realize that um, currently we've moved away from uh, talking about or classifying food in terms of uh, carbohydrate, proteins, and vitamins, or maybe minerals and such like things. Now, we don't categorize food like that. So the, the latest is uh, categorizing food in terms of food groups. And we have uh, 10 food groups, uh, which we are going to look at um, in the subsequent slides. So uh, for now, moving forward, uh, forget about the carbohydrate, protein, vitamins, but now focus on uh, understanding the 10 food groups. Okay. And uh, these are the 10 
food groups. So the first category is uh, the category of grains and grain products and all other starchy foods. So they belong to this first group. So it contains grains, grain products, and all other starchy foods. They belong here. Okay, the second group is uh, a group of legumes or pulses. And uh, this includes things like uh, dried beans, peas, lentils, etc. So in the subsequent slides, we are going to see examples of uh, each of these food groups. The third food group is that of uh, nuts and seeds. And we are, we are going to see examples of the same. And we are going to see examples for each group and even um, the benefit for each uh, of these food group or what they provide to our bodies. And then the fourth one is uh, that of uh, dairy and dairy products. And then number five, we have flesh foods. And this includes beef, poultry, fish, etc. Number six, we have eggs. And uh, this can be eggs from um, chicken, ducks, and uh, etc. Number seven, we have dark green leafy vegetables. And then number eight, we have other vitamin A rich fruits and vegetables. And then now number nine, we have other vegetables. And number 10, we have other fruits. Okay, so you can realize that we have uh, fruits that are rich in uh, vitamin A being categorized in another group, and then others now coming under group number 10. And uh, the same applies to vegetables. You can see we have like three categories here. We have vegetables that are dark green leafy, and then we have those that are rich in vitamin A, and then other vegetables. And we are going to see in the subsequent fly, uh, slide, sorry, the examples. Okay, now I want us to look at uh, each of those food groups, and then uh, we look at examples and the food sources. And then finally, the benefits. And then finally, I'll come to some key recommendations, uh, especially for lactating or breastfeeding mothers. Now we begin with the first group, which contains grain, grain products and other starchy foods. So this group uh, contains foods like maize, wheat, bread, sorghum, millet or cassava, potatoes, green bananas, etc. So all these examples belong to the first group, which we are calling grain, grain products and other starchy foods. And what is the benefit of this uh, first group? So this food group provides energy and important minerals such as iron and calcium. Uh, whole meal cereals, uh, which are healthy, and they also contain more nutrients. Okay, then we move to the second group. The second group is that of uh, pulses, and we said examples are beans, peas, uh, lentils chicken peas, cow peas, etc. All these uh, belong to that group. And what is the benefit or the role of this food group? So basically this group um, is a good source of protein, energy, minerals, and vitamins, okay? And then uh, the next group is that of uh, nuts and seeds. And then uh, with nuts, we have Examples like cashew nuts, 
um, almonds, walnuts, Brazil nuts, etc. And then under the seeds, we have um, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, uh, and then we have the sesame seeds. So those are the examples. And then the nuts and seeds, what is their role? So these, they are good sources of uh, protein, energy, minerals, vitamins, and uh, they also contain some healthy fat, okay? And then the next group is that of dairy. And this contains uh, foods like uh, fresh milk, yogurt, cheese, butter, um, mala, or fermented milk. And uh, this group is uh, a rich source of calcium, which is important for healthy bones and uh, teeth. And then the next one is uh, flesh foods. And uh, these include meat, uh, for instance, beef, goat, lamb, mutton, etc. Um, other examples include uh, the poultry, like uh, chicken, duck, turkey, uh, etc. Also, we have uh, fish like tilapia, tuna, uh, sardine, um, omena or daga, and many other examples of fish. Okay. The next group is that of eggs. And uh, with eggs, we have uh, eggs from uh, chicken, duck, quail, eggs, and many others. And uh, for this group, this is a good source of uh, protein, minerals, and vitamins. And now we come to the first category of vegetables. Now the dark green leafy vegetables. So these are dark green in color and uh, they contain, uh, they, co they are composed of uh, uh, leaves from cassava, pumpkin, amaranth, spinach, kale, etc. So the dark green ones. So this one, uh, this group contains a variety of uh, vitamins and minerals, which protect uh, our bodies. Um, and especially now for, 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 for these mothers, they protect the mother and uh, the baby from diseases, okay? So we know uh, that uh, dark green leafy vegetables, um, they contain some nutrients which will help uh, in protecting uh, the baby and the mother's body to do the fighting of diseases. And then now we have other vitamin A rich fruits and vegetables. So fruits and vegetables that are rich in vitamin A. Now, these one include mangoes, papaya, melon, etc. Okay, so this one, when they are ripe, so they have that... Uh, yellowish color uh, on the outside. And then we also have um, carrots, pumpkin, uh, orange fleshed sweet potatoes, and uh, many others. So all these come to this group of uh, other uh, vitamin A rich fruits and vegetables. And then now we have other vegetables which are not rich in vitamin A and they are not also dark green in color. And these are vegetables like uh, the cauliflower, cabbage, cucumber, and uh, many others. So for this uh, category of vegetables, they are good sources of vitamins and minerals. And then finally, we have now other fruits, okay? Other fruits, now uh, we have fruits like uh, apples, avocado, banana, blackberry, and many others. So for this category, they are good sources of um, vitamins and minerals. And now, uh, when we are talking about uh, a mother who is breastfeeding, so apart from uh, the normal 
three meals. That is uh, breakfast, lunch, and supper or dinner. So because of uh, the body needs, because uh, they require to make uh, the breast milk so that uh, the baby can also benefit, they need to eat well. So, and the recommendations uh, are as follows. Now, apart from the breakfast, lunch, and dinner, these women are supposed to um, take two extra meals each day, in addition to uh, the three regular meals. And again, in between the main meals, they are supposed to have two snacks. That is uh, between breakfast and lunch, they should have a snack. And then between lunch and uh, dinner, they should, they should have a snack. But now, again, they're supposed to have two small extra meals, yeah, so that uh, they are able to uh, nourish their bodies well so that they can make enough breast milk for their children. Now, each of, uh, each of the meals, yeah, should be from uh, four food groups and uh, eat a variety of foods, uh, but we are saying that uh, per day. So variety is very key, but we are saying the recommendation per day is that uh, a mother should be eating food from at least five out of the 10 food groups per day. That is from morning um, to evening when she goes to bed. But again, we have talked about uh, breakfast, a snack in between, lunch, a snack, dinner, and then an, an, an extra small meal. So these meals are supposed to be, uh, they are supposed to come from a wide range of uh, these food groups that we are talking about. And then something else we need to take note is that uh, when we are talking about a snack, uh, this is basically a healthy meal. Yeah, I know people confuse when we talk about snacks, maybe people think uh, we are talking about things like, uh, uh, say, um, crepes, uh, or maybe popcorn or biscuits, no. So when uh, we are talking about nutritionally speaking, when we talk about a snack, is any healthy food from any of these food groups. So for example, a fruit can be a snack. So you see between breakfast and uh, lunch, a mother can take a fruit, that is a snack. Or a mother can take uh, a glass of milk, that is a snack or a mother can take a glass of uh, porridge. That is a snack. So that is what we are talking about. So there should be a variety. So that at the end of the day, a mother is eating food from at least five of the 10 food groups at the end of the day. Yeah. And then in, a, in addition to that, uh, what we say or the recommendation is that uh, for the mothers who are breastfeeding, they need to take a lot of fluids, uh, for example, milk, uh, soup, juice, porridge, and uh, beverages, and also water, which will be able to increase uh, the milk supply. So all these, uh, now, when we are talking about small extra meals, and uh, even the snacks. So all these can form part of the snacks that uh, the mother can take. So she can take maybe milk, soup, juice, porridge. Yeah, all these can form part of the snacks that she can take in between meals. And then a critical thing to note is that um, a mother who is breastfeeding uh, is supposed to separate the meals uh, from beverages such as tea or coffee, uh, because this will prevent interference with iron absorption. So limit the intake of tea 
or coffee. Otherwise, um, this should be taken an hour before or after a meal, okay? <coughs> so this should be taken less frequently, but now if it is beverages, they can consider other beverages like uh, soup, like milk, porridge and such like. But uh, take note, uh, if a breastfeeding mother wants to take uh, tea or coffee, it should be one hour before meals or one hour after meals, because uh, there is a risk of uh, interfering with the iron absorption. Uh, because you find that uh, such beverages contain some um, substances called tannin, and uh, the tannin will bind uh, iron. And that's why now iron will not be available in the diet. And then something else uh, that we recommend is that a mother is supposed to engage in light physical activities for them to stay healthy. And then another thing is that they need to take adequate rest. Yeah. And uh, previously, we talked about the role that um, other family members or friends can play uh, to support a mother to breastfeed uh, successfully. And therefore, they can be supported by friends so that they can have uh, adequate rest as well. Okay, now this is uh, basically a summary of uh, what we've been talking about. Uh, in summary, we are saying that a mother who is breastfeeding is supposed to eat three meals, two snacks, and two small extra meals. So the small extra meal can be taken say very late um, in the evening or when she's uh, going to bed yeah and uh, the three meals we are talking about breakfast lunch and supper and then we are adding two snacks and then two extra small meals and when we we, we mentioned that, that uh, a snack can be a healthy meal like a glass of porridge, a glass of milk. She can also take soup. Uh, she can take an, uh, a fruit and such like, yeah. Okay. And then most importantly, she also needs to take um, plenty of beverages so that she can be able to make uh, adequate milk for, for her baby. Yeah, and the beverages can be water, um, can be soup, milk, porridge, and all that. And uh, we are just giving caution about um, taking tea and milk and uh, coffee, sorry. So tea and coffee uh, should be minimized because of the risk of uh, interfering with the iron absorption. And if a mother has to take tea, it has to be an hour before meals or an hour after meals. Okay, so basically, um, nutrition for breastfeeding women um, is not complex. So what is important is uh, just understanding the 10 food groups and then um, making sure that at the end of the day, when a mother takes uh, three, the three meals, uh, two snacks and two extra meals. At the end of the day, the mother should have uh, taken food from at least five out of the 10 food groups that we listed here. Okay, so that is uh, very critical. And uh, in addition to that, uh, she needs to take a lot of fluids. Uh, we've talked about uh, the separation of uh, tea, coffee and meals. And most importantly, uh, light exercises uh, for her to stay healthy. And also the need for adequate rest. Yeah, so basically, 
that is it for nutrition for lactating women unless there are any questions maybe i'll check through the chat box to see if there is any question Okay, thank you for that. I, I have a, uh, okay, I, I'm just curious. Yes. Um, can someone breastfeed? Okay, you have a child, you have a child, a kid, and then you are breastfeeding, and then you accidentally or unknowingly you become pregnant. Can you continue breastfeeding and taking the same quantities of food that you are used to take before being pregnant? Mm. <laughs> That is a, a tricky one because uh, now the, the, the body requirement, um, the body requirements will be higher. And uh, that means the mother needs to eat more. Um, but again, the breastfeeding, uh, we need to be cautious because uh, the breastfeeding can continue during the early stages of pregnancy but we don't encourage the mother to continue breastfeeding uh, during the late phases of the pregnancy. Because again, uh, yeah, she needs to focus on uh, the growth of uh, that baby. But again, you see the hormones um, that control breastfeeding may also interfere and cause uh, some uh, early, labor the mother can go into early labor so and we don't want that so um it can be encouraged during the early stages of uh, pregnancy but not uh, the, the the late stages but what is very critical is um now she needs to eat more yeah because the body requirements are higher Okay, so I think that question has been answered. I saw someone, I've seen a same, same question again in the chat box. I believe that has been answered. Okay, I have unmuted everyone. You can unmute yourself and, and say something. Okay, I do have a question. How different are the nutritional requirements of a mother who is breastfeeding twins and that one who's breastfeeding a single infant. Okay, thank you for your question. So a mother who is breastfeeding twins and uh, uh, the, the one that has a, a single baby. So in terms of uh, feeding, uh, it's not different. Uh, they can just feed the same way. Uh, but what is important, if you can remember from our previous lesson, uh, so long as the mother is feeding well, uh, she can produce adequate amounts of milk. Because um, what is critical is that uh, the, the, the milk production and even milk letdown is uh, under the control of hormones. But the mother now needs to, the, to relax, yeah? She needs to get focused uh, into breastfeeding. And that's why we are saying that um, uh, family members, friends need to come in and support this mother to breastfeed. So if she's focused and she's relaxed, yeah, then the hormones will work well and uh, enough milk will be produced. Because, um, yeah, a mother can, uh, can produce enough milk for even twins, and even triplets, yeah. So that's why if you realize um, nowadays, but again, we have, uh, we have uh, different mothers. There are those that can produce a lot. And that's why we have uh, a milk bank nowadays uh, at Pumwani Maternity Hospital, where again, um, mothers who have uh, a lot of breast milk can express and uh, donate that milk. Because uh, if you participated in the last uh, session, we were talking about um, uh, breast milk being the, the best. There's nothing that can be compared with breast milk. Yeah. 
So, so long as uh, the mother is eating well, uh, at least five food groups out of the 10 in a day. And uh, following the recommendation we've just uh, stated, uh, then she will just be able to produce enough milk um, for her twins. Yes. So there is no extra recommendation for mothers with twins, no. Okay, thank you. And also yeah. on breastfeeding, how do we go mm -hmm. about mothers who are HIV positive and they have a newborn? Are they advised to breastfeed or how do you go about that? Okay, thank you so much uh, for that question. I know um, I'll be speaking about the current uh, recommendation in the Kenyan policy, that is. Um, we've come a long way, uh, but now I know HIV has been there with us for some time now, and a lot of research has happened, and now we know how to handle the situations uh, much better. Anyway, in a nutshell, I will say this. Um, the recommendations uh, for feeding for a mother who is HIV positive um, is this. The mother will just continue to breastfeed her baby, okay? But now, uh, two things need to happen. Number one, you see, uh, during antenatal clinics, uh, the, the mother will be diagnosed. But now we encourage diagnosis at every stage, okay? So antenatally, the mother will be tested. And if she is found to be positive, she will be put on antiretrovirals. And what the antiretrovirals will do is that um, they, they will lower the viral load. And by bringing down the viral load, they are lowering the risk of uh, the mother transmitting uh, the HIV to her baby through the breast milk. And then the second thing is that um, the baby will be put on prophylaxis for HIV, okay? And um, once that has been done, then the risk of uh, transmitting this uh, the HIV to the baby will be reduced completely. Um, only that she needs to take note. Uh, she needs to be taught. You know, we discussed about positioning and attachment in our last um, topic. She needs to position her baby well. Uh, she needs to attach her baby well on the breast to avoid some uh, breast conditions, which can increase the chances of her transmitting the HIV. Uh, because if she has breast conditions like mastitis or uh, cracked nipples or fissure or breast abscesses and such like things, okay? Now you find that um, when, we, when she has such conditions, uh, the risk of transmitting the HIV to the baby becomes high. But now, when she has such conditions, um, there is a way we manage. And uh, the breast that is affected, what she will be doing, uh, she will be put on medication, uh, she will be managed on that breast, but the good breast, she will continue breastfeeding from the good breast. Yeah, so basically, the recommendation currently is that um, even a, an HIV positive mother can continue breastfeeding her baby for six months, introduce complementary foods, and continue breastfeeding up to two years or even beyond. But she needs to take note of the things I've uh, mentioned. But most importantly, to prevent the breast conditions, she will be counseled and taught how to position and attach her baby properly on the breast so that she doesn't have those breast conditions that may increase the chances of transmitting HIV to her baby. I hope I've answered your question. Yes, thank you. Okay.
Okay. Um, I can see a question from Alice. Are there any drugs that can control milk production in lactating women? So I'm not sure what you mean by controlling milk production. Is it increasing milk production or reducing milk production? I don't know. I don't know if you are, you are here, Alice, maybe you can uh, clarify what you meant. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, I'm also wondering what he's referring to, but I think maybe our question was, which I've seen most of the common, you find uh, there are some women either who does not have enough milk or are mm -hmm. struggling to, they are not able to produce uh, milk in a natural physiological way. Mm -hmm. So perhaps maybe he's asking if there's a solution to that. And yes, there are some uh, supplement to, when they're given to those women, basically increase the milk uh, production. So I'm just figuring out because now she's not in the chat. I think she has disappeared. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So thank you, Edwin. I hope uh, it's Edwin. Thank you. Yeah. Now. Um, now. Sorry, we can remain muted in the meantime as I respond to that question. Then we can have the next person asking a question. Okay. I'm hearing some echo. Now, um, there is this challenge of uh, a mother who is breastfeeding having this perception that uh, maybe she does not have. Sorry, uh, my co host, you can help me mute some people so that we can focus and uh, respond to the questions. Okay, I think I can continue and uh, respond to that question. Okay, I've muted her. Now we can continue. Now, um, the perception that a mother is not having enough breast milk, uh, in most cases, is not real, okay? Because if you look at the science behind milk production, uh, basically, it is under the control of hormones. And we have the hormone prolactin, which... Uh, plays a role in uh, production of milk. So milk will be produced and milk will be available uh, now in the breasts. But now for this milk to come out, it requires another hormone again, which is uh, oxytocin, okay? Now to eject the milk. Now during the breastfeed. So what oxytocin will do is now we'll be ejecting that milk from the milk ducts now to the uh, baby's mouth during breastfeeding. And uh, from the science, we know that uh, these two hormones um, are secreted from the uh, anterior pituitary gland. So the perception that I do not produce enough milk is not real. So it is normally a perception. You see, maybe a mother uh, sees she has small breasts and she thinks maybe with the small breasts she can't produce enough, or maybe she's just worried. But um, what is important is that um, from the science, we know that uh, milk is under, uh, the production of milk is under um, the control of hormones. 
unless now that mother has a problem with the pituitary gland, then she cannot produce enough milk, which is a very rare condition. So usually what happens is that uh, uh, majority of the mothers do not know how to position and attach their children on the breast so that the children can suckle effectively. Uh, I know in the previous uh, topic, we talked about the positioning, the attachment, um, how uh, a mother can do that so that now she can breastfeed comfortably and milk can come um, without any problem. I know today we are not tackling that, but uh, yeah, with proper positioning and attachment, a mother will just be able to breastfeed well. And another indicator, you know, some women are usually just worried, but what you need to do, first of all, there are indicators to, uh, to let you know whether the baby is getting enough milk or not. The first thing you should do is uh, uh, checking the weight of the baby. So uh, babies are weighed on a monthly basis. So what will guide you to know whether the baby is getting enough or not is uh, the weight on a monthly basis. So if on a monthly basis, this baby is gaining uh, an average weight of um, a half a kilogram, then this baby is getting enough. If the baby is uh, passing urine at least six times in a day and the urine uh, is not dark and concentrated, then this baby is getting a, enough breast milk. So what you need to do is just to reassure. You know, there are those women who just need that reassurance. Um, you look at uh, how the weight is going and uh, just reassure that with this weight gain, your baby is getting adequate amount of breast milk. So you don't need to worry. But again, if uh, not enough milk is coming out because of a poor technique of positioning and attachment. Because uh, again, what you need to do is uh, you need to give a chance to that mother to breastfeed as you observe. And then you will take note of the things that she's not doing right. So first of all, you begin by acknowledging the things she's doing right. And then now for the things that she's not doing right, then you, you correct. And then uh, once that is done, um, uh, the mother will have to do a return demonstration as you observe and yeah, encourage her to go home and uh, continue doing that. So basically in a nutshell, I will say that um, um, it is just a perception because any mother has the ability to produce enough milk for her baby. And even if she has twins, uh, she has the ability to produce enough milk for even the twins. And uh, usually the challenge is just around poor positioning and attachment. And you need to observe that and then cancel. And uh, the other thing I've said is uh, look at how the weight of the baby um, has been increasing or decreasing over time. Uh, if uh, the baby is not gaining a half a kg per month, then it's true the baby is not getting enough breast milk. Then you need to tell this mother to breastfeed as you observe, and then take note of the things she's not doing right, cancel, let her do a return demonstration, and for sure, you'll see that uh, the mother will successfully do the breastfeeding. Uh, I hope I've answered that question. Okay, let me just check uh, through the chat box to see whether there are <clears throat> other more questions.
So on the issue of drugs, there are no drugs that can be used to enhance milk production, no. So the mother just needs to be supported. Remember in our last topic, we, we, we said, the mother needs to have that adequate time to breastfeed. She's, she's not supposed to be in a hurry that, okay, um, she breastfeeds for five minutes and then rushes to work or something is no. So breastfeeding time, she needs to have adequate time to make sure that uh, the baby breastfeeds from one breast um, exhaustively before moving to the other breast. You remember we talked about uh, the milk and the hind milk and uh, the, the, the contents of the two uh, being different. And you, we also mentioned that um, if a baby is satisfied, so the baby will just doze off by himself, but um, the, the mother is not supposed to remove the baby from the breast because, okay, she has some other things to attend to, no. Um, the mother needs to be supported at the time of breastfeeding to breastfeed without any interference. And um, again, I will insist from the science, any mother is in a position to produce enough milk so long as uh, she's been given the support required, she is relaxed. Um, and uh, yeah, unless, but I've never seen, in my life, I've never seen uh, that woman that has that uh, problem of pituitary gland, which is affecting the hormones and that, uh, causes um, reduced production of milk. I've never come across such. So there are no drugs that can be given to enhance milk production, no. So the mother just needs to be supported uh, to give enough time to breastfeed her baby. Yeah, so if there are other chores to be done, she needs to be supported so that uh, she relaxes and just breastfeeds her, her baby. Uh, Someone is saying uh, most women during their third trimester complain about uh, pain, difficult in sleeping after eating. Uh, okay, you know, in the third trimester, uh, the pregnancy has grown and uh, they are stretching of uh, muscles and even uh, the backbone. Uh, you will find that even the shape of the backbone may not be that straight. Uh, because of those changes, yeah, there could be those uh, difficulties. But again, we encourage uh, mothers, pregnant mothers also to engage in some light exercises. So they should not just uh, sleep because they are pregnant, no. So some light exercises will also help to relieve such things. Um, Alice is also mentioning that uh, also does the size of the breast also matter in milk production? No. So regardless of the milk size, yeah, the mother can be able to produce um, enough milk for her baby. Yeah, so just take note that it's not uh, the breast that is producing the milk. So the milk, um, that signal is coming from the pituitary gland uh, which releases now the hormone prolactin to do the milk production. The milk comes to the breast. And then again, oxytocin releases that milk now from the breast to the baby's mouth. So the size of the breast does not matter. Okay. Um, I think there's someone who is reminding that uh, the attendance list should be resent. And then uh, Veronica, what makes uh, breasts not to have breast opening immediately after delivery. So you struggle breastfeeding in the first week. Okay, um, I want to acknowledge that it is true there are some women who have some difficulties. So there is um, some delay in some few women for the milk to come in, okay? But um, the, the, the recommendation is this. 
Usually, these may come as a result of uh, uh, delaying to initiate uh, breastfeeding. But the recommendation is that immediately after delivery, within the first hour, the child should be put on the breast. It is true there are those who uh, may have some delay in uh, milk coming in, but we recommend that the mother should continue putting the baby on the breast. Because the more the baby is put on the breast, now uh, that is what stimulates now the hormones to start working. But now you'll find that uh, some women, what they do is that, especially immediately after delivery, because you will not find that um, immediately after delivery, a lot of milk coming. No, it will just be some few drops. Yeah. And then with time, it increases with time. So the mother is supposed to be encouraged to continue putting the, mother, uh, the baby on the, on the breast. And even at that time, that very little milk or that very little colostrum, yeah? Um, the baby doesn't require a lot. And then we are saying breastfeeding on demand. So day and night, every time, yeah? So the most important thing for such cases is that initiate breastfeeding within the first hour. So as soon as possible. And uh, even if there is uh, a delay in milk coming in, so the mother should continue putting the baby on the breast because the more the mother puts the baby on the breast, that is what now will stimulate the hormones to work and uh, eventually milk will come in. And then Teresa says uh, some factors that affect breastfeeding are uh, psychological. And that's why we are saying that uh, breastfeeding time is special time. So the mother needs to relax. She needs to pay attention to the baby, everything. She needs to concentrate uh, on the baby so that uh, now the hormones work, the milk will just come, yeah? So it should not just be a by the way, no. She needs to give it all the, the, the time that uh, um, is required, okay? Oh, uh, someone is saying uh, they have not signed today's form. Okay, and then Ali is saying, uh, is it true that taking a lot of uh, um, boga ya kienyeji enhances uh, more milk production? Um, <laughs> on this one, I know for instance, what will enhance is uh, the, the fluids that the mother is supposed to take. You remember we've talked about um, the mother taking fluids like uh, water, uh, milk, uh, porridge, soup, and all these. Um, but I know there are those, uh, there are those uh, beliefs, I don't know, because uh, depending from which part of the country you come from. Because there are people from maybe central Kenya, they believe if you take njahe, maybe it will increase milk production. I do, but scientifically, um, there is no that evidence. But what I can uh, uh, authoritatively say is about the fluids or uh, beverages. So the, those ones are very important. Uh, the, a breastfeeding mother needs to take a lot of fluids and it can be in form of um, water, milk, porridge, soup, and all those things. But we discourage tea, especially um, immediately uh, or taking tea with food. Yeah, that one is not encouraged. Uh, that should come in an hour before meals or an hour after, okay? Yeah, but uh, there are plenty of those fluids that uh, a breastfeeding mother can take. And then Eunice is asking, does porridge intake enhance production of milk? Yes, so porridge is um, one of the example of fluids we've been talking about. So it enhances that. Okay, yeah, I think someone uh, was answering also. 
And then Alice again is asking, can a lactating mother stop breastfeeding for a while, then later on continue breastfeeding? Yes, um, there are situations where a mother can uh, stop breastfeeding. For example, if the mother is having uh, some breast condition, I talked about some breast condition uh, during the session. Uh, if a mother is having some breast conditions like a mastitis, for example. Um, okay, a mother, what the mother will do, or maybe, especially breast conditions are the ones that um, can make a mother maybe not to breastfeed directly. And uh, what the mother can do is uh, the mother can express the milk, okay? And then the baby can be fed with the, the breast milk using the cup. And in the last, uh, in the last session, we looked at how uh, a mother or uh, anybody can feed a baby with breast milk using a cup. So we said it is either breastfeeding directly from the breast or cup feeding. So those are the recommendations. But now, once the situation uh, has been handled, maybe the mother, uh, the condition has been treated and now she is fine, then she can continue breastfeeding the baby directly now from the breast. Yeah. So. Those are the situations where uh, maybe a mother can uh, stop breastfeeding. Yeah, I don't know if you meant any other, but uh, those are the ones, uh, those are the situations that I know that uh, a mother can uh, temporarily stop breastfeeding and then she will just be expressing her breast milk. And then after the condition has been treated, then she will do what we call relactation. <laughs> so someone is asking, so the milk does not go bad. <laughs> uh, no, it doesn't, it doesn't. Okay, so you are saying um, if you stop, you stopped for a month and then later on, come back to, <laughs> to breastfeed. So it's not that um, <laughs> the breast, you see, it's not like uh, it is a container where milk has been staying there for a month, no. You know, this is, uh, you know, by putting the baby on the breast, now you are stimulating the hormones and they start working. So the, that milk is just fresh. There is nothing like uh, milk going bad. <laughs> no, <laughs> the milk will just be fine. There is no problem. So however long, uh, maybe I can surprise you with something. Um, did you know? But okay, it's not that it is a recommendation I'm making. Uh, this is just off the cuff, uh, just to explain um what uh, the situation here because uh, the, this question has just provoked me to say this but it's not that uh, it is a recommendation in the policy but it is something that is a fact for instance um uh, for instance a grandmother for instance uh, say there is a maternal death maybe um a lady has given birth and by bad luck, she dies. And I know maybe some people here can relate. And then a grandmother takes that um, baby. Of course, this grandmother stopped breastfeeding long time ago. And then this my grandmother starts breastfeeding. Do you know that uh, over time, um, she'll start producing milk and uh, she'll just start producing milk and uh, milk that will be adequate to satisfy the baby. Now, you can imagine a grandmother. Now, do you, will you say that because she's a grandmother, now 
her milk is old. <laughs> so there's nothing like that. So it's just good milk. So yeah, milk doesn't go bad in the breast or anything like that. No, it will just be fresh milk that will be produced. So anyway, I've just used that to um, <laughs> uh, to demystify that point that uh, oh, milk may go bad. No, so you can imagine a grandmother who stopped breastfeeding many years back, and by the act of putting the baby on the breast, eventually milk will just start coming and it will not be old milk or bad milk it's just good milk and yeah but it's not a recommendation i'm making so it is something that maybe just happen you know extraordinary circumstances uh, yeah calling for extraordinary <laughs> solutions but that is not the recommendation yeah so currently with the policy especially the kenyan policy is that um, uh, for such children, um, if they are lucky, for instance, they are in Nairobi and they, they can access um, mil the breast milk from the bank, from the milk bank, um, from Pumwani maternity, that's good. Or um, if they cannot, then the other option will be um, exclusive replacement feeding with infant formula and uh, i think we talked about that uh, last time yeah and i don't want to repeat that so that is the recommendation so let us not go out of this session and say oh grandmothers can yeah it it, it just happens in extraordinary circumstances but yeah it's not uh, something that we are promoting Okay. Okay. Um, Ezekiel is asking: Is it true that uh, foster mother, uh, foster mothers, um, despite their age, produces milk? I think that is uh, what I have explained. Yeah, regardless of the age. That's why I was saying any mother has the capacity to produce milk. And uh, you can see, regardless of uh, the age, by the act of uh, the mother just putting the baby on the breast, it will stimulate the hormones. Once the hormones start working, milk is produced. And that is it. Yeah, so it doesn't require anything. Okay. Okay, I think um, uh, you're saying, but why when you stop breastfeeding, uh, your breasts hurt and uh, in a jar, when uh, pressing them, there is this uh, thick yellow milk. Okay, you see when, um, you are used to breastfeeding and then maybe you stop abruptly you see uh the the milk ducts can get blocked and those breast conditions can come so in such a situation when you are seeing that uh, yellow milk it's not fresh milk that one for sure uh there would be a problem so you know uh we encourage if for some reasons uh you are away from your baby maybe you you can express the milk so the thing is uh, milk needs to come out otherwise if uh, we have the milk stasis that is when uh, milk um stays in the breast especially for those women who are used to breastfeeding so when it overstays there uh, then in most cases, if you, you are not careful, if you don't express that milk, then most likely there will be milk stasis, and then um, it will move to maybe non-infective mastitis, and then later on, infective mastitis. But you should separate this from uh, the other points we are talking about, someone who has overstayed for long without so it's not the same case that like uh, maybe 
someone who has uh, stopped breastfeeding for some days or a week and then she starts having such. Okay. Are there any more questions or we are satisfied? Because uh, I can't see any more question in the chat box. I hope we've exhausted all of them. Oh, I have a question. There is this, yes. um, I don't know if it's a myth or it's, I'm not sure about it, but when it comes to mothers who are lactating, um, yes. based on how they are feeding, are they meant yeah. to add weight or lose weight considering it is said that lactating mothers actually do lose weight once they start breastfeeding their babies? <laughs> okay um now uh if a mother is feeding well they are not supposed to to lose weight as such because again uh, you know the the, the 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 physiological changes that happen even from pregnancy coming all the way to breastfeeding, those hormonal changes. You see, these hormonal changes uh, is what brings about um, uh, some weight gain. So you'll find that uh, um, a pregnant mother and even going into um, that period of uh, breastfeeding, in most cases, you'll find that um, they gain weight. And uh, basically, it's just because of uh, okay those changes. So if she's feeding well, uh, she's not supposed to uh, lose weight as such. And if she loses weight, maybe there's a, a problem. Maybe she's not feeding well. But in most cases, because of those physiological changes, most most women will uh, put on some weight. Yeah. Okay. But it will be for some time. And uh, if um, mother breastfeeds well, eventually, yeah, that weight will uh, go off as uh, she continues to breastfeed. And even as the period of, okay, as she wins off the baby again, that will disappear because, yeah, the hormones also keeps going down, down, down like that. So eventually it will just go off. So ideally, uh, because of the physiological changes, the, the, the most women will put on some weight, but not uh, um, weight reduction. So if there's weight reduction, maybe there's something else. Either she's not getting enough, or maybe there's just some, something else that needs to be looked into. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I uh, can see Mary asking that, can breastfeeding act as a, a form of family planning? Yes, I know. I touched on that briefly uh, in our last topic and um, I know family planning is a totally different uh, topic, and I'm sure it is something that you are going to, to cover if you have not covered yet. But um, yes, I want to confirm that uh, breastfeeding is a form of uh, family planning method, uh, which we call lactational amenorrhea. And this one will only work if you are doing a 
exclusive uh, breastfeeding, which is uh, <clears throat> breastfeeding day and night on demand. Okay. Um, but there are conditions to it. So you, you should not say that, okay, because I'm breastfeeding now, I will not uh, get pregnant. No. So there are limits to this. And um, anyway, since we are not covering uh, the family planning topic, um, I don't want to go uh, beyond that. But uh, for me, I'll just confirm that, uh, yes, it is uh, a form of uh, or a method of breastfeeding, which we call lactational amenorrhea. So if a mother is breastfeeding exclusively, um, yes, uh, she will not uh, see her menses. Uh, but I've just said there is a limit to that. Yeah, uh, you cannot say that. Okay, she will just continue breastfeeding for two years and say, okay, because I'm breastfeeding, then I'll not get pregnant. No, there is there is a limit, and uh, I'm sure when you'll be tackling that topic of um, family planning, then these will be addressed in details. Okay. I think um, Ezekiel is helping me to answer that question by mentioning that uh, lactational amenorrhea method goes for a period of six months if the mother is doing exclusive breastfeeding. So that's the limit I was talking about. So it cannot be forever. Yeah, but again, when you'll be tackling that topic, you can uh, ask as many questions as possible so that you, you get to understand. I have another question. Yes. Uh, there's this narrative that uh, some types of food uh, would yes. cause uh, stomach troubles to the, to the child. If a mother takes, uh, let's say, skumawiki or a lot of beans, uh, it may cause, I don't know, bloating or some sort of stomach trouble to the child. Is that true? Um, okay, that happens, that happens, but uh, it is rare. And uh, you know, children are different. And uh, now the mother needs to be observant. But it's something that is um, a bit rare. But I, wa I want to confirm that, yes, it happens to some uh, children. But now the mother needs to observe. Uh, for instance, the way you are saying if she eats sukumawiki, maybe that, uh, again, uh, affects the baby. The baby may start having diarrhea. But now if she doesn't take that, then the baby doesn't have uh, those uh, complications yeah but it is something rare yeah it is something rare but i know it has happened to some to some few children but i cannot pinpoint and say it is sukumawiki no so for some children it's something else so it is a kind of i don't know an allergy or something yeah so for some children it can be sukumawiki for some it can be something else but now you know the mother he may monitor the trends, you'll just be able to, to know, but it is something rare that may happen to some few, few children, but a majority, usually they don't have problems. Okay. Yes. Okay, so if there are no more questions, I'd beg to end. Okay, so 
maybe if there are more questions you can pass them uh, uh, through Esther and then I can be able to to provide answers and then she'll be able to share with you okay so otherwise uh, thank you so much I cannot see more questions I'd want to end there. So, yeah, thank you. So feel free if you uh, you you have any questions after this, uh, share them through your coordinator, and then I'll be able to uh, prepare responses, and then you'll be able to get the feedback. Otherwise. Uh, Thank you so much and uh, have a good night. Good night. Okay, bye.